Hi guys, so in this video I will try to cover 90% of the information that you need to do landscape photography in only 20 minutes. Now there are of course no way that you can actually learn 90% of landscape photography in only 20 minutes. That's just not how learning and internalization works. However, I am inspired by that 90-10 principle, which states that 90% of the information or the results can be gained by putting in only 10% of the effort. However, to gain those last 10% of the results and information to become a unique and outstanding and great photographer, you need to put in 90% of the effort or the majority of the effort. See the information in this video as the basic framework that landscape photographers work within. Now be sure to hang out to the end as I do have an announcement in regard to Black Friday. So first things first, you need a camera. And in the end, it doesn't really matter what brand you choose, whether you choose Canon or Sony or Nikon or some other brand, you can't really see the difference on the final photo. It doesn't really matter within a landscape photography context either whether you choose a DSLR or you choose a mirrorless. There are some practical pros and cons for each system, but you need the experience through actually using the cameras before you know which one is for you. Different cameras also have different sensor sizes. And within the same generation of sensors, the rule of thumb is the bigger, the better. Of course, you compromise on some practicalities such as size and weight and cost. However, there are other practicalities such as lens choices and weather sealing that are better with the more professional cameras. So on to actually using your camera. And there are three settings that determine the brightness of your photos, shutter speed, aperture and ISO. And let's start with ISO. If you increase the ISO, you also increase the brightness of your photo. But there comes a huge trade-off, which is that you introduce noise the more you increase the ISO. And here sensor size really makes a difference. The larger the sensor from the same generation of sensors, the less noise the more you increase the ISO. However, the good part is that it is relatively easy to keep the ISO low in landscape photography. The next factor to increase or decrease the brightness of your photo is the aperture. The aperture is the hole in your lens. So the more you open up that hole, the more light you let in onto the sensor. So aperture is measured in f-stops and the more you increase the number, the darker the photo becomes because the aperture becomes smaller. This might sound counterintuitive and confusing to begin with, but it is in fact because an aperture is measured in fractions. F-stops are fractions. So F8 is actually one over eight, and F22 is one over 22. And since one over 22 is a smaller number than one over eight, it means that the aperture is smaller. Just as ISO had a secondary feature, so does aperture. The more you open up your aperture, the shallower your depth of field becomes. This means that anything in front of where you focus and everything behind of where you focus becomes more blurry as you open up your aperture. In the world of photography, this kind of blur is called bokeh. The rule of thumb within landscape photography when you're photographing big vistas is to have everything in focus from front to back throughout the entire photo. So you want to avoid this kind of blur, which means you would have to use a closed down aperture. So something in the region between F8 to F16. Be aware there are many exceptions to this relative to your sensor size, the lens you use, the scene you photograph, and your creative choices. The last factor to determine the brightness of your photograph is shutter speed. Shutter speed is measured in seconds, so when your camera says one over 60, it is one sixtieth of a second. 
The longer you have your shutter open, the more light hits the sensor and the brighter your photo becomes. As with ISO and aperture, shutter speed also has a secondary feature. The longer you have your shutter open, the more blurry things that move around in your scene becomes. That could be moving cars or tree branches and leaves that moves in the wind. In landscape photography, you generally do not want to blur your landscapes. However, by purposefully applying a longer shutter speed, you can blur out water and create some beautiful ethereal effects and really tame the chaos of running water. In this example, I've applied three different shutter speeds to the same waterfall in Iceland. The three photos are very different in their expression and photographers will of course disagree about which one is their favorite. But remember, this is subjective. It comes down to your opinion. It is by finding the right balance between your shutter speed, aperture and ISO that you can get an optimal exposure. And your optimal exposure is alone determined by the available light in your scene. If you know you specifically want to photograph at f11 to have your entire scene in focus and ISO 100 to have as little noise as possible, then your shutter speed can only be one specific value and that is determined by the light meter in your camera. If you know you want a specific shutter speed, then you need to find the optimal balance between your aperture to get whatever you want to have in focus in your scene in focus and the ISO and keep it where it is not too noisy. So to brighten up your photo, you either make a longer shutter speed, you open up your aperture or you increase your ISO. But which one of the secondary features that you want to compromise is up to you. Many landscape photographers also like to use filters. The most common is the ND filter, the neutral density filter, and it works basically as sunglasses for your camera. It is used to further manipulate your shutter speed or aperture. In landscape photography, it is mainly used to manipulate the shutter speed, to drag it out, to create a longer shutter speed so that you can get that blurry water. Then there's also the polarizing filter and the polarizing filter cuts out polarized light from your scene with the effect of making the blue sky bluer, some greens greener, generally removing atmospheric haze and reflections from surfaces. You do not always want to use a polarizing filter, but it is a part of most landscape photographers kit. Then there are lenses, and lenses are better at determining the optical quality of your photos than the individual cameras are. So if I use a good lens on a bad camera, it can actually create some really good photos. Whereas if I'm using a bad lens on a supposedly really good camera, the photos are less than optimal in their optical quality. Sony and Canon and Nikon and other camera manufacturers all have their professional lines of lenses and they are usually better than their non-professional line of lenses. Some lenses are zoom lenses while others are called prime lenses and prime lenses cannot zoom. However, the benefit is that they usually have better optical quality. They can open up their aperture more, which is very beneficial for night and astrophotographers. How broad a perspective of the lens in front of you that the lens covers is called the focal length. And focal length is measured in millimeters. There is a lot of math behind it, but what you need to know is the lower the millimeter, the broader the perspective the lens covers. A practical rule of thumb is you want to cover a focal range from 16 mm to 200 mm within landscape photography. A collection of three lenses can usually do this. A 16 to 35 mm, a 24 to 70 mm and a 70 to 200 mm. These three are usually referred to as the holy trinity of lenses. 
this combination of lenses usually have the optimal balance between optical quality and the threshold for how many lenses you want to carry out into nature. You can of course mix and match as much as you want. Using fewer lenses, such as one super zoom, you compromise image quality, and using more lenses, you compromise practicality and cost. Some lenses are specifically designed for the APS-C sized cameras, and some lenses are specifically designed for full frame cameras. You can use full frame lenses on APS-C cameras, usually, but it doesn't work the other way around. You cannot use a small lens designed for a small camera on a big sensor camera. The relationship in focal length is also different between full frame cameras and APS-C sized cameras like my A6000 here. You need to take the crop factor into consideration. So if I use a full frame lens on my APS-C camera, I need to multiply the focal length with 1.5 on this specific camera. Sadly, there's not really a lot of standardization within APS-C sized camera sensors. So maybe it's 1.5 or 1.6 if it's Canon, and I think Fuji is 1.8. So if you want to photograph a perspective which is equal to 16 millimeter on a full frame camera, then you will need a lens that goes all the way down to about 10.5 millimeter on an A6000 here, an APS-C sized camera. The most common accessory of landscape photographers are their tripods. Because of the low ISO and close down aperture, we can usually end up with some fairly long shutter speeds. So we will need a tripod to keep the camera still to avoid that the camera moves or shakes while we take the photo. And that is the main purpose of any tripod. It is to keep the camera still. That's ingenuity there. <laughs> Tripods comes in many different sizes and qualities. The rule of thumb is the larger and heavier it is, the more sturdy it is. And sturdy is a good thing here. However, in my experience, what you really only need is a good quality carbon fiber travel tripod like the one I have here. The one I'm filming on right now is my large tripod. It is really nice to have when you are out in the field, but it is also a pain in the to carry it out there. So when it comes to tripods, it's down to you how much of an extra weight you want to carry out into the field. So now we come down to the fun part of landscape photography, actually taking photos. So what should you take a photo of? Well, obviously landscapes. However, there are many different kinds of landscapes and there are many different kinds of approaching the landscape. Some landscape photographers like myself like to photograph epic vistas. Some like to tell conceptual stories while others like to zoom into the details and create beautiful and abstract photos just for the pure sense of aesthetics and feeling. Some photographers value the environmentalistic, ethical parts of photography. Some like to just document the beautiful here and now moment in time. Some value high technical perfection. Some value originality and exploration. Some value the story of the photo, while others again value the impressionistic approach to landscape photography. Some photographers use landscape photography as meditation, just as some people like to go out fishing, while other people of the more optimistic kind like to try to make a living from it. There are no right or wrong approach to landscape photography as the broad subgenre of photography it is. Most people don't even know what it is they actually value when they start photographing. The truth is that we probably all value to a varying degree a little bit of everything I just mentioned. And what you value as an individual comes down to your background and the influences around you. 
and that might very well change over time. I would be highly surprised if it didn't. There is no secret formula to landscape photography. There is no set path that you have to follow. Just do what you want to do. Take the photos you want to take. Tell the stories you want to tell and just be the best at it if you want to compete on the marketplace of landscape photography. And yes, of course, if you want to live off of landscape photography, it's a really good idea to learn some business. I have found that I really like everything from the minimalist simple photo over woodland photography to the big epic grand vista. What my photos usually have in common are interesting weather, atmosphere, mood, a sense of scale, adventure and order. And it completely makes sense when you look at the person who I am. I'm a kid of the 90s and the zeros, a real millennial with a huge influence from pop culture, Hollywood, blockbusters, computer games, and with a lifelong interest for science and later philosophy, I also really like to find order and explanations for the world around me. And all of these things, I would argue, actually shines through quite a lot in my photography. Now, of course, everything within landscape photography is not subjective. There are also some relatively objective things that you need to do to improve your photos, such as composition. And composition is something I really, really like, especially because I want to find order in the chaos around us. But composition also helps you to tell the story you want to tell, guide the viewer through the photo, and really just heighten the aesthetic qualities of your photo. For landscape photographers and many other photographers, composition really makes or breaks your photos. And in the end, composition is really just a question about creating order in your photo. Some pointers within composition is to have a kind of focal point. You need to have a subject, something you are actually taking a photo of, which is not just a beautiful view. Your photo also needs to be in visual balance, so it doesn't feel as if it's tipping to one side or the other. The elements within your photo also need to play together. So if you're photographing down a road, make sure that that road leads you into the photo and towards your focal point instead of leading the viewer's eyes out of the photo. In that way, the entire photo has to make sense. Composition is hard, but luckily I have a lot of videos on my channel here about composition. Be sure to check those out afterwards. Finally, yet importantly, as you do digital photography, you also need to learn some editing. And to get the most out of your digital image file, you need to photograph in RAW format instead of JPEG. There are many different programs to edit your photos with. The two most common within landscape photography is likely Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. They are not the same. Photoshop is the most powerful tool. However, Lightroom is a really, really good place to start. Whether you like to go gung-ho in the editing and create something very impressionistic and very different from what you saw with your own eyes, or you just want to use editing to solve some different problems that you can't do in field within the camera, such as putting two photos together with two different shutter speeds, or you want to create something which was very much like what you saw with your own eyes, it is still important that you edit your photo. A photo straight out of camera, whether it is RAW or JPEG, was never meant to be an exact representation of reality. There are many creative choices to take in digital photography, whether these are within the camera or in the editing phase, just as there are in analog photography, where the choice of film you use and the darkroom processes heavily influence the final photo. So this was about 90% of what you need to know as a landscape photographer. 
Now that you have spent 10% of the effort to gain 90% of the information, let's flip this 90-10 metaphor on its head. Because now it's time to hit those 90% effort to gain those last 10% of the results for you to become a great, unique landscape photographer. Now, I of course know that there is so much other information and small nuances that you need to take into consideration when you do landscape photography. I know I just cannot cover every single information or feature of any camera in a 20 minute video. This is the broad overview. With the release of this video, it is Black Friday slash Cyber Monday week. And you can right now get entire $100 off on my big 28 plus videos course, Photoshop for Landscape Photographers. In this course, I basically cover everything I know about editing. All the way from the very basic things about how to actually use the programs, and all the way through on how to make really complex masking and edits in a fairly simple way in Photoshop. I cover things like adding atmosphere and glow, focus stacking, focal length blending, luminosity masking, and how to create high contrast monochrome photos. Now, obviously this is only a very small part of this huge, huge course. It is brand new as I only released it a few months ago and everybody who is enrolled have seemed to be extremely happy with what they have got. And on that note, a huge thank you to all of you who have actually enrolled in the course. It means a lot to me that I can create my products and you enjoy them. So be sure to check out the links in the description to get those hundred dollars off. And if you also want to know more about composition in landscape photography, be sure to check out and get my ebooks. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would highly appreciate both a like and a comment.